So I'm, I'm Dr. Nathaniel Evans. Um, I am an orthopedic surgeon here at Ortho SC. I've been here for five years. I, I joined in 2016, back when we were strand orthopedics. Um, I do a lot of shoulder surgeries, probably about 60% or so of my practice. Uh, I do a good mix of like shoulder replacement type of things. Uh, and then also shoulder arthroscopy. So rotator cuff issues, labral tears, um, deal with um, some of our local high school athletes and then um, take care of some of the coastal Carolina athletes too through the basketball team and things like that. So thank you for um, joining. I, I know this is a topic that um, I get asked about a lot. Um, it's obviously a common um, recreational activity down here in Myrtle Beach. Uh, it's one I take part in as well. So uh, hopefully we can give a little bit of enlightenment about um, different injuries and things that are associated with um, playing golf and then what we do about them. And then uh, next week, I think one of our therapists is going to be talking about um, different ways of treating and preventing those injuries and things. So uh, to get started here, I, I thought we'd kind of show a couple of swing sequences um, of some uh, famous golfers. Nobody's more famous than Tiger Woods. Uh, and this is not going to be necessarily a talk about different swing types or anything like that, um, or really getting into the weeds about the biomechanics of a golf swing, but I think it's important for um, pointing out some of the things we're talking about. Because when we're talking about shoulder injuries in golfers, there's really two separate shoulders that are involved here. So um, the lead shoulder, the forward shoulder, in the case of Tiger and most golfers that are right-handed, it's your left shoulder. So we're gonna use that just for the ease of simplifying things. We'll talk about the lead shoulder. That'll be the left shoulder throughout the presentation. Obviously, you can switch that around if you're a left-handed golfer. Um, and then we'll talk about the trailing shoulder, so the right shoulder. And so I'll show you four or five different swings here. Um, but the key thing that I want to focus on on this is, is the shoulders and specifically kind of the shoulder turn and then the position that the arms are in during the shoulder. Now there's a lot of other stuff that goes on that can be distracting with this. I mean, you talk about hip turn, you can talk about the knees, you can talk about you know, leaning forward into it, you can talk about uncoiling, you can talk about head position, you can talk about all this different stuff. And it's all important and plays a role in the golf swing, um, but specifically today we're gonna be focused on the shoulders. So the, the main kind of points that we're gonna talk about in terms of the lead shoulder uh, as Tiger demonstrates well here, when it gets back into the back of the backswing, the shoulder has a lot of what we call adduction, adduction, or bringing the arm across the chest. Um, and then it elevates also, it goes up um, above the head, above the shoulder level here. So this, this pulls a lot on the back of the shoulder and then compresses the front of the shoulder. And I've got some slides later to show some of the anatomy about what's involved in all that. But that's kind of the, the gist of that. And the back shoulder, you can't see it very well here. I've got some other shoulders, but it takes the arm into an abducted, uh, basically the elbow away from the body and then external rotation. So going to like he's touching the back of his head or like the same position that a thrower gets in. So a lot of the injuries that a golfer has in their trailing shoulder um, are similar to things that uh, a, a baseball player or something that like that would have. So. Technically, golf is not an overhead sport, but about 30% of the swing, your arms are in an overhead position, so you can certainly get some of those. And then as you go from the top of the backswing down through acceleration phase, through contact, and then through the follow through, basically those shoulders kind of reverse. And so the left shoulder pulls across the arm here, and as much as anything, the right shoulder really pushes down. And so that's how you generate the force is one, by uncoiling the shoulders and releasing your hips through the swing, and then the arm kind of driving down. And I'll show a couple different swings and different golfers do this differently, um, but it, it, it all kind of looks the same. So if you look at Tiger here, here's another picture, uh, another swing sequence of Tiger. This is from just like a year and a half ago, the end of 2019. Um, so this is as he's gotten older, but he still obviously has a a beautiful full swing, but the same positions that we're talking about. The leading arm is adducted, it's elevated. The trailing arm is externally rotated, abducted. And then by the time he gets through the follow through, it's reversed. 
Now, here's another famous golfer, Dustin Johnson. He looks a little bit different. Um, so his arms are really extended up at the top of his swing, and he gets this, um, this tremendous shoulder turn. I mean, his shoulders are basically past 90 degrees here, and then he uncoils. And um, so his, his swing is very distinctive. But so he might have a little bit more extension in his trail arm, but the and he has more elevation in his lead arm than most um, golfers do, but still the same kind of basics. If we go, this is Joaquin Neiman. So he is like the polar opposite of um, Dustin Johnson. Dustin Johnson's like 6'3". He's built like a, um, like a basketball player, something very tall and lanky. Joaquin Neiman's something like 5'6 and like 140 pounds or something. And he still drives at like 330 or something ridiculous like that. So um, he generates his power a little bit differently. You can see him like almost getting into like a baseball position here where his hands are so far in front of his body. He's really ducking down. You know, a lot of times they talk about keeping your head level throughout the swing. Well, look how far down his head dips and then comes back up throughout his swing. But the, the thing we're focused on here, again, is his arms. And so his lead shoulder adducted, elevated, his um, trailing arm, his right shoulder here, abducted, externally rotated. And then as he goes through the swing here, he, he kind of reverses that. So here's somebody that probably looks more like a swing like a lot of us. I mean, this is Zach Johnson. Zach Johnson's a tremendous player. He's won two majors. That's more than anybody else in the top 10 in the world, except, well, it's as many as DJ, but um, nobody else has more in the top 10 now that Rory's dropped out. So this has worked on the highest level for him, but he does not generate nearly the, the shoulder elevation uh, as Tiger or DJ or Joaquin Neiman or or dozens of other guys on tour, and he doesn't hit the ball as far, but it's the same kind of stresses on the shoulder. So some of you guys might be saying, well, why, you know, why is he showing us these ex these uh, swing sequences of all these pro golfers? That's not what my swing looks like, but the basics of it, especially at the top of the backswing and starting on the, the downswing, which is where all the force is, uh, looks the same. So here's Ben Hogan. Um, a lot of people consider him to have the classic golf swing, the purest golf swing. He was not a huge hitter. This is way before um, all the technology was brought in to make distance as big a part of the game as it is. But I brought this to show exactly, I mean, this this looks the same. His left shoulder straight out here, adducted across the arm, um, pulling and stretching the posterior soft tissues here. And then this arm abducted his elbow out away from his body somewhat. Some people, I'll show you Jack Nicholas here in a second, really kind of uh, put that chicken wing out, um, but externally rotated, putting the arm back behind his head. Um, oh, actually, I don't have Jack Nicholas, but, but here's Annika Sorenstein. So for the, the lady golfers out there, same thing, um, same basics of uh, the golf swing um, in terms of the position of those shoulders at the top of the backswing. Uh, here is a soon to be famous golfer. This is my son, Sammy. He is two. Uh, he loves to play golf, but his swing uh, looks the same in terms of the shoulder position. Uh, you could argue, should he be taking this big of a swing with a putter? Probably not, uh, but it's effective for him. But same kind of thing, trail or the trailing arms abducted, externally rotated, lead arm adducted across um, forward elevation. Um, same, same basics there. So, so let's talk about some of the anatomy, what actually is responsible for all this. So this is looking at somebody from the back side. So the right side is going to be over here, the left side over here. This is just different layers of muscles. But, but the, the reason for this is I'm going to talk about some of these muscles in the back that don't get a lot of attention, but that are really important for uh, the golf swing. So the levator scapulae are up here. The rhomboid muscles are here. These muscles connect from the spine over to the scapula, which is basically the shoulder blade, the bl shoulder blade, I'm sorry. And so as you are bringing your arm up and out into abduction, external rotation, these muscles here are the key ones that are firing and pulling your scapula back, and that helps you get your arm out of position. Also, some of your rotator cuff muscles, which I'll show you, which would fit in here in, in kind of these... Um, fossas or these kind of um, empty spots here on the back of the scapula, that's where those muscles go. They attach to the humerus and actually will rotate your arm out. 
And then this muscle here, I've got another picture of this, is your serratus anterior. It's a muscle that probably most people haven't heard of. It's a kind of a series of a lot of muscles that come off of the ribs and attach to the scapula and basically stabilize it throughout the golf swing. And then the trapezius is this bigger muscle that goes over the top of the, the rhomboids and these other scapular stabilizers, but does a lot of the same thing. It kind of elevates it and pulls it backwards. Interestingly, during the golf swing, your deltoid, which is the biggest kind of muscle group out here, bodybuilders and, and stuff that have these big rounded bulky shoulders, um, that's the one that makes up all that muscle bulk. It actually doesn't really do much of anything in the golf swing. They've done a lot of studies where they put these nerve conduction units on the shoulders. It's actually relatively silent during the entire golf swing, both for the trailing arm and the leading arm, which is a little bit counterintuitive to what, what you would think. Uh, here, here's a picture kind of from the side. So this is showing that serratus anterior group of muscles coming off the, the side of the rib cage here that goes back to the shoulder blade. Uh, I, I showed this for the, the latissimus muscle. So this comes off kind of the back. If you see these bodybuilders that look almost like they have these wings kind of on the back and it kind of makes up the back part of the armpit. That's what this muscle is. It actually attaches to the humerus and this plays a big role on the trailing arm. So your right arm as you're doing your downswing and it pulls uh, that arm and helps generate some of the power. The, the other thing that does that is this pec minor. So the pec major is the larger muscle for the bodybuilders that have the big rounded chest. Um, that's the pec major. That's the part that's cut away here. Uh, but actually the one that actually pulls across the shoulder blade, it's attached to this little process up here called the coracoid process. But the one that actually will help bring your scapula, bring your shoulder blade back across and pull it down towards your body uh, is actually this pec minor muscle here. And so this is a, another kind of underappreciated muscle. It gets really, really tight in a lot of people that have shoulder problems. So a lot of people that have their, their shoulders kind of slouched over and hunched over, it's because this muscle is very tight uh, and the muscles in the back of the shoulder, those levator scapulae and rhomboid muscles, those are not firing as well because this muscle gets too tight. So it, it plays a role both in pulling your arm through uh, and then also stabilizing the shoulder as, as you're going through the follow through. So that's, that's those muscles there. And then this is looking at the inside of the shoulder joint. So this is a right shoulder. This is imagine you cut all the bone, the arm away, cut all the muscles and things away. This is down looking into here. So the, the, the reason I wanted to show this is it shows this structure around called a labrum. It's basically like a bumper that goes around the shoulder joint. It deepens the shoulder joint and stabilizes it. And so this acts almost kind of like a suction cup and keeps the humeral head centered in there. Now, one of the things that we're going to talk about that you can get is something called a slap tear. SLAP stands for superior labral. So the top of the labrum, the top of this um, suction cup kind of bumper around the shoulder joint, um, and then A to P, anterior to posterior. So it basically describes the location of where this tear is. Um, your biceps tendon attaches up there, and this attachment site is where a lot of this pathology is. So as your arm gets into this abducted external rotation, it pulls this biceps tendon up here, pulls across the back, and you develop this tear. So this is a really common injury in pitchers uh, or any kind of overhead throwing athletes. But like we mentioned, um, the trailing arm, so the right arm for right-handed golfers can get this uh, lesion as well. By the time for your lead arm, for your left arm, that you're going through your follow through, everything's slowed down enough that you're not getting as much of uh, a force across it here. And, and so that's much less common injury there. And then outside of that, these muscles that are seen in cross section here are the rotator cuff muscles. So these are the muscles that we spend a lot of time talking about in clinic and one of the most common things that we see injured. Uh, they do help with some of that motion in the trail arm um, and um, basically kind of are an overuse type of injury. They, they don't get as much of a direct trauma, but as you go through the swing over and over and over again, it can lead to kind of degeneration and stuff. So most of our golfers that are, you know, older than 55 or so, this would be the number one problem would be rotator cuff degeneration. The other thing that this picture kind of shows is how these rotator cuff muscles fit underneath the, what's called the acromion or the edge of the shoulder blade. So as you're putting this arm in these positions where it's turning out or for your left arm where it's going across the arm, um, these muscles get really pinched in this space here. And so that can also cause irritation. So uh, especially on your leading arm, it can get 
irritation kind of of the top and the back as if you're moving it across. And then for the, the trailing arm, the right arm, it's more kind of anterior and superior. Those aren't absolute rules, but kind of a general application. So then we'll kind of talk a little bit about what's involved in each in each phase and then what um, what is injured there. So and we've already talked about a lot of this. So the, the, the trailing arm, the right arm, the trapezius, the levator scapula, the rhomboids, all those muscles kind of in the back part of the shoulder pull this right arm back. The, the left arm, your subscapularis, which is one of the rotator cuff muscles in the front, it pulls the shoulder kind of in. And then your pec minor that we talked about pulls your arm kind of across. Like we mentioned, your deltoid, um, your latissimus, actually the biggest muscles over there, pretty inactive during this part of the swing. Then as you go through the downswing, that's when things here on the right side they still fire, but it's mostly to kind of control your downswing. And then those muscles across the front of the shoulder, the subscapularis, the pec muscles, the latissimus that I mentioned pulls the humerus down. That really pulls everything and helps generate some of that power. And then the left arm, your leading arm, kind of switches and some of those muscles in the back start firing to, to stabilize things and control it throughout the swing. Uh, and then the follow through again, kind of the the opposite of, of all that. So then what 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 are the, the risk? What kind of structures get injured? Um, you know, the we mentioned on the on the trailing arm, on the right arm, the rotator cuff from the overuse um, type of things, the labral tear is specifically the slap tears from that peel back motion, and then the impingement where it gets uh, compressed up underneath the edge of the shoulder blade. And then the leading arm, so one of the things we didn't mention, I don't think I have a I thought I'd put a different picture in here for the AC joint. The AC joint is basically the end of the clavicle and up at the acromion, basically the tops of the shoulders here. So when you're crossing your arms, um, that area gets really compressed. And so like weightlifters, bodybuilders, guys that do a lot of bench press, um, laborers that do a lot of overhead work. So guys that in install like heating and air conditioning units and things like that, that joint wears out really quick. So the left arm, the leading arm gets a lot of pathology there and gets a lot of, um, pain there. We mentioned the stretch of the, the back of the rotator cuff and then the impingement as well. And then, you know, why, why is, why did people get these issues? So, so number one is just purely age. Uh, younger golfers don't get a lot of these things. They get some of this actually posterior stretching of the rotator cuff. They get some instability um, occasionally in, in that, but they don't get a lot of cuff tears and things like that. As you get older, that tendon gets more and more worn. Uh, it can be more prone to tearing. Part of this is a loss of flexibility. So they've, they've done a lot of studies with the golf swing and stuff like that. The, the biggest difference, they didn't really see a lot of difference for how high above the head arms went and things like that, but how much the arm externally rotated. So how much the arm turned out was the biggest difference between a group of college golfers that they studied and then a group of golfers over the age of 60. And so about 23 to 38 degrees. So if you look just straight at you, straight ahead is zero degrees, all the way out to the side is 90 degrees. So 38 degrees is almost halfway there, 45 degrees is halfway there. So that's a big difference if you're losing almost half of your external rotation that senior golfers don't have. So the, the way that that manifests itself is you don't turn your shoulder back as much because you don't get that external rotation. So you might compensate for that by putting your shoulder out, by abducting it out. So Jack Nicholas did this a lot. He had kind of a flying elbow. Um, it worked great for him, obviously. Um, but for some people, that can be a hard motion to control. And so, um, you know, some instructors and things will talk to you about tucking a towel or something under your arm to keep your arm down so it doesn't trail like that. Well, that might not work for you. You might not be able to do that. You might need to let that arm abduct to be able to generate the turn to generate any kind of power for as you uncoil and move back through that it that it generates that hit. And then, and I'll, I'll show you another picture of that in a second. And then the last thing is just the repetitive nature of, of the swing. So just like anything that we do, if you do it over and over and over again, it's gonna gradually kind of wear out. So the best advice to that is take less strokes on each game. So good luck with that. So you can certainly injure other body parts. Um, you know, Brooks Kepka has been dealing with a knee injury recently. Tiger Woods famously had the ACL tear and the two of plateau stress fracture when he won the U.S. Open at Torrey Pines. Um, a lot of guys go through um, knee issues and things. And then back issues are a problem, not just for 
like Tiger, obviously the most famous for that with all his issues has had with that, but older golfers. So, and, and the reason is kind of what we just talked about there. So this is a picture of Rory McIlroy in his younger days. He's got a great shoulder turn, got a great hip turn. He can really clear everything out and then kind of reposition himself and, and regenerate his power as he gets down here. This picture over here on the right shows what happens if you can't turn your arms and stuff very well. So you, you try to stand up to try to get your club head back. You can imagine if your shoulders don't turn very much that that club's going to be stuck here rather than behind you. That obviously if you're swinging from halfway up, you're not going to generate as much power. So one of the things guys will try to do is stand up. The, the problem is that puts a lot of stress on the back to go from kind of your natural um, neutral position here to standing up to crouching back down. This guy almost looks like Charles Barkley when he swings here for how low and crouched he gets, but it puts a lot of stress across the back. And it's a lot of that is due to the fact that the shoulders can't turn as much. The hips as well uh, play, a, play a role in that. But to be able to clear the club head, you, you try to abduct your um, trailing shoulder here and, and bring your um, bring your head and uh, club back further here. So, you know, what's the treatment for all these things? So, so just like most sports related or activity related injuries in orthopedics, the, the main thing we start off with is this rice treatment. Almost anybody that's had a uh, injury has heard of that. It's rest, ice, compression, elevation. The, the hard one with this is compression. That There's not really a lot of good shoulder braces. You can certainly get some of these neoprene things that will wrap around the shoulder and provide a sense of stability. Uh, but the muscles of the shoulder are so much larger and so much more intimately attached to the, to the humeral head and to the joint capsule and all that kind of stuff that just your natural compression is going to be far more than you can generate with a, a brace. But you, you can certainly try something like that and it, it does work for some people. Um, so taking some time off of the golf swing if you're if you're having a lot of pain, anti-inflammatory. So I got a lot of patients that I'll tell them just take an, an Aleve or a couple of ibuprofen or something an hour before you're around and then go out and play, and then that should uh, that should help things quite a bit. Next step would be talking about therapy. So again, we see a lot of people with rotator cuff issues, a lot of people with labral pathology. So working on those scapular muscles, the ones that we don't think about very often that. Uh, we don't pay much attention to, quite frankly, because we don't do much with them. We don't we don't operate on them. So, so these are the kind of things that we send off to the therapist, and they do a great job of, of strengthening those and isolating those and giving you different exercises to focus on those to help restore that balance. And again, the, it's, it's important for just the dynamic nature of being able to pull your arm back, but then also as you're swinging quickly, um, keeping that shoulder stable as it goes through that range of motion. Um, the next step up in terms of invasiveness would be doing injections, so steroid injections in the shoulder. Those oftentimes are really helpful. So especially if somebody's just gone out and played a lot in a week or um, had one uh, event or one outing that really kind of flared things up, give them an injection and tell them to take it easy for a couple of days will oftentimes um, calm things down. Then, then the next things to start talking about swing modifications. Obviously, uh, if you look on the senior tour and watch guys like um, Colin Montgomery and Bernard Longer and guys like that, their swings don't look the same as they did for themselves uh, and certainly not the same as the guys on the PGA Tour look, but they're still effective. So shortening the backswing, doing less shoulder turn um, can, can be an effective way of dealing with that. Obviously, you, the thing you lose is distance, but the answer to that, unfortunately, a lot of times is just swallow your pride, move up a couple of tees uh, and enjoy the game um, as much as possible. And then the, the last thing would be surgery. So we, we do all these other kind of things before we get to any kind of surgery. Usually surgery is going to be preceded by an MRI to look at the structures of the shoulder, see exactly what's going on. Uh, and, I, and I included a couple examples of some of the things we talked about here. So this is what a rotator cuff repair looks like. So this is looking down at the rotator cuff, the muscle that turns into the tendon that inserts onto um, the, the humeral head. You, oh, this is a pretty common tear pattern where you get this U-shaped tear. And the way we fix that is put some anchors. They look like these plastic screws down here in the bone. It puts suture through the tendon. And then we use that to pull the muscle back over 
and then put a couple more anchors down over here on the side and it compresses that down, acts almost kind of like um, putting pegs in to secure a tent down uh, and then also co compresses across the bone there to get that tendon to heal back. But, so that's a common operation that we would do. And then we've talked uh, a good bit about the labrum. So the slap tear up at the top, sometimes you get these anterior labral tears as well. Um, but basically what you do is wear that bumper, wear that um, rim of tissue that goes around the, the glenoid is, where that tears off, you can fasten it back down, secure it back down with these sutures. So this is the cartilage over here. These are the sutures that are attached to these little anchors in here. And this is the labrum and it restores this bumper of tissue um, to, to stabilize things. And the, these things are much cooler than they were 10 years ago. They used to put these in, they'd have these big knots of suture here and it would abrade the humeral head, cause all this irritation. Now a lot of these are uh, knotless and so they're very low profile. They don't cause any irritation, very slick operations and, and very successful operations. So um, that's, that's what I have um, for now. Lisa mentioned that she might have some questions and I'm certainly ha happy to answer any of those. Dr. Evans, you actually have three questions in the Q&A and then you also have three questions in chat. Can you pull them up on here? You here. do. Look at the very top yeah. and hit Q&A. Yeah, all right, so the first one, um, if you have a torn rotator cuff, can you still play golf? I, I think the answer is absolutely to that. I, you know, rotator cuff tears come in all shapes and sizes. So if we go back to this um, picture here, um, you know, this is a relatively kind of moderate size tear. Sometimes these are so small, we don't even put multiple anchors in. It might just be one anchor repair. Uh, sometimes it's so small, we don't even need to do any sort of uh, repair at all. Sometimes we just clean it out. Uh, other times it's a big massive tear. So, so part of the answer to that would be how big of a tear do you have? Um, certainly by playing golf, you would run a little bit of a risk of increasing the size of that tear, making that tear worse. Um, in, in my experience, that does not happen nearly as often as kind of we are led to believe in training and, and things like that. I, I have a lot of patients that function pretty well with rotator cuff tears. We let them go back to their normal activities. Uh, see them periodically and they, and they seem to be doing just fine. I've had several patients that we've MRI'd years after maybe one of my previous partners had done an MRI. And honestly, a lot of those tears don't change much. That, that's not always the case. Some of them certainly get worse, but if somebody's not having pain, they're able to, to do their activities, including golf, I, I would certainly encourage them to keep doing that um, if, if they're not having a lot of problems. So one of the downsides to rotator cuff repair is how long that takes um, to, to recover from. It can be six to 12 months for a recovery from that. And for some people, that's, that's just a long time. They don't, they don't wanna mess with it. For some people it's necessary, but for some people they're functioning pretty well. So I would say in, in general, yes, you can still play um, with the torn rotator cuff. Now, if, if you try to play with your torn rotator cuff and it hurts like crazy every time you play and it's making you miserable and you're losing sleep and stuff, then that's when you'd need to come in and we'd need to talk about some of those other things like injection or, or potentially even surgery. So thanks, thanks for that. All right, so the next one. Um, do a lot of TPI assessments. So that's like a kind of, uh, I can't remember what the, it's basically a swing assessment kind of uh, thing for the golf swing. Commonly find that the root cause of individuals' injuries tend to be rooted from stiffness in the thoracic spine. I'm wondering if this is a trend you see in which individuals are getting rotator cuff injuries, hip labral pathologies, even lateral epicondylitis uh, as a result into hypomobile thoracic spine in the golf swing. So I think, I think that's probably right. I think, you know, just as it kind of mentioned in there, maybe to some people, does their back stiffen up because their shoulders don't rotate enough? Could the opposite happen? If, they're, if their spine is not as mobile and they can't turn as much, can that lead to compensation in, in the shoulder? I, th I think that's absolutely true. Um, I, I think that probably brings up a good point about just in general with um, going into the golf swing. It's important to stretch beforehand. It's important to have um, some sort of yoga slash Pilates slash whatever your mode of kind of more stretching type of therapy is. Um, built in a system to, to stay mobile for exactly those reasons. Uh, I, I think it's important to, you know, when you get to the golf course, try to go early, 
yes to practice your putting and stuff because everybody's a way worse putter than they, they probably could be otherwise uh, but also to, to to stretch out to to loosen up as best you can so you don't have some of these injuries that are all right i can't turn as much so i'm just going to try to swing harder i'm going to pull harder with my left arm so that gets you this lateral epicondylitis which is basically tennis elbow on the outside of your elbow um, by by having a mobile core um, that can certainly free up the rest of your swing obviously that's easier said than done as we get older that kind of stuff is going to be harder to maintain but um, certainly a very valid concern so it, so to answer that yes I, I think that is and then um, is there any specific testing you find most useful when assessing the golfers posterior cuff so the so part of that would be in terms of the leading shoulder if we're worried about instability kind of events so there's different types of tests we can use um, which it would be the same ones I would use for like a like a posterior labral tear, so like a posterior load and shift kind of test, um, just simple subluxation, so trying to let somebody relax their shoulder and seeing if I can man manipulate their humeral head and push it out the back of the shoulder joint. Again, that's pretty uncommon. That, that's something that's more for a younger golfer, a, a high-end, you know, kind of college level or, or high school level golfer. Um, they might be more likely to develop some of that some of that, honestly, we would just leave alone. Um, that, that would be like baseball players. They, they get kind of this um, hyper external rotation in their throwing arm and they're, they get an internal rotation deficit where they don't turn their arm as far in because when they go th their, through their throwing motion, they want their arm to get way back here to generate as much force. So same thing with a golfer, even if they had a little bit of hypermobility uh, in the back of their shoulder, we wouldn't want to tighten them up because then they wouldn't get their arm all the way across their body. They wouldn't get as big of a, a, a backswing and then that would lose some power for them. So we, we probably wouldn't do much of that. Now on the older golfer, if we're looking at posterior cuff um, for like an overuse degenerative kind of tear, then we would look more for kind of external rotation kind of thing. So the infraspinatus, the supraspinatus, the, the posterior part of that, and then the teres muscles, those are responsible for external rotation. So putting somebody's arm in at the side, seeing how their strength is when they turn back, putting them up in an abducted position and then doing external rotation, doing what they call the horn blowers test. Those would be the kind of things that I'd, I'd be more looking for um, for, the, um, for the posterior cuff. Um, so that's the Q&A stuff. Let me see. Go to the top, Dr. Evans. Go over to the word more, I got there, and then you'll see the chat. Okay. Um, all right. So sitting out of a sand trap, hit a tree root that I couldn't see. That sounds like you, Lisa. And uh, since the weekend, come on, come on. <laughs> I'm having pain in my shoulder. It's keeping me awake at night. Should I wait a certain amount of time before I make an appointment just to make sure I'm good? Yeah. So I think that um, that. I think that fits in with a lot of uh, things with this, you know, whether you had a specific moment in the round where you felt something, I mean, I've, I've had several patients, shoulders, knees, things like that were like hitting in and out of a, a bunker or something like that, or a club gets stuck when they weren't expecting it, um, can cause problems and all kinds of things that you, you thought that body part was going to keep moving and then all of a sudden it didn't. Um, so I think kind of expanding that to a general question, I would say in general, probably one to two weeks is a good amount of time to wait before you'd come in and see us to see if there's anything more. So, and again, that depends on your level of discomfort. If, if it's something where you just can't even lift your arm, yeah, come in and see us sooner. But if it's just a general discomfort and trouble sleeping and, and getting dressed and grabbing a seatbelt and things like that are giving you trouble, I would do, you know, rest it, take it easy, don't play for a week or so, put some ice on it, take some anti-inflammatories, um, and, and see how it does. Most most things will get better by a week or two, and then if it's not, then um, come come see there. And then question two: Should should I just play through my shoulder pain? I'm not really old. I'm 35, but seeing distance go down, it's more likely just bad mechanics or overuse. What do you suggest? Waiting or coming in? So I think um, if you're seeing distance losses, I, I think part of that has to be just kind of an honest assessment of how the rest of your body is. And so if you say, I feel really good otherwise, 
and my right shoulder just hurts every time I swing a golf club and it's affecting me during my daily activities. And, uh, I can't turn a doorknob as well, or I can't, um, reach the seat belt behind me and things like that. Well, that might be a labral tear that, that might be a real pathology. Uh, if it's everything kind of hurts, um, then, then that might just be, yeah, your distance is going to go down as, as things uh, get older. I'm older than 35. So I consider that extremely young. So, um, I think, you know, having seen, um, you know, we've got that club connections and stuff now. So we, we've got, um, golf galaxy, we've got the PGA store, we've got pros at 70 some courses or whatever in the area that can kind of evaluate your, your golf swing and see if you're having, um, some of these issues with, yeah, you're not turning and things like that. I, I think that's helpful. And then, and then coming in and seeing us and let, let us examine you is, is a good, uh, a good place to start. You know, I, I think certainly younger patients, it's more likely that there's something going on in the shoulder if you're having problems than if you're, you know, quite honestly, you know, 55, 60, 65, a lot of those things is just going to be some of these repetitive overuse type of gradual degeneration of the rotator cuff and labrum um, that may not be as concerning. And then third question, if I have a clicking clunking sound when I swing, should I be concerned? It's not really painful, but I'm sore after 18 for sure. I think um, I don't get as concerned about the sounds, the clunks, the clicks, the pops and things like that. There's a lot of stuff that goes on my shoulder clicks and pops. Some of it can be just your biceps tendon uh, gliding in and out of its groove. It can be your rotator cuff sliding underneath your chromine. It can be these different ligaments in your shoulder, the coracoacromial ligaments, your glenohumeral ligaments, those kind of things that just rub past each other uh, as you're going through a normal swing. So in general, if, if it's not causing any kind of pain, that's not something that uh, probably needs any, any kind of attention. Now, if you have pain every time you have that, that click, that clunk, that uh, grinding sensation, then yeah, that, that's something that we're concerned about. We'd try to evaluate um, both with physical exam or more advanced imaging and things like that. So those are all good questions. Uh, and then, okay, another one. So are you seeing patients in your market common location? I live near there and I don't have to drive too far. So the answer to that is yes. So we do have a new market common location. Uh, it's basically right out in front of the Walmart neighborhood market. We've been open since early January, basically. So about three months or so there. Um, that's a great location. I, I go down there on Wednesday mornings. Uh, as we get busier and busier, we'll, we'll probably expand to kind of Wednesday afternoons, but um, for now it's, it's, um, mostly Wednesday mornings for me, but, uh, it's, it's a great spot. We have physical therapy on site there. Um, there's only eight, um, rooms. So usually two doctors at a time seeing patients there rather than the office where I see people in Carolina forest, we might have eight or nine doctors in the office. So it's, uh, it's a little bit less crowded, a little bit, um, uh, less imposing. Um, I was a little bit, honestly, uh, nervous isn't the right word, but just kind of not knowing what to expect when we started going down there at first, but I honestly really like it. It's a, it's a good change of pace. Uh, it kind of seems to be a little bit more intimate setting with patients. We can spend a little bit more time with them. It's not as hectic. Uh, and for a lot of our patients, it's really convenient for them. So yeah, please, please come see us down there at the, at the market common location. I think I'll check the Q and a section here, but I think that's good. And so um, for sure, please, please feel free to, to reach out to us with any of your needs with golfing injuries, any other shoulder injuries, knee, back, hip, whatever, whatever it is, um, that, that's what we're here to, to do. That's, that's what we're here. You know, our whole goal with um, treating patients is to get them back to doing the things that they, they like and love. And whether that's a joint that's wearing out, needs replaced, whether it's an injury from a sport or recreational activity, this is the kind of stuff that, that we have trained for and that uh, we, we really enjoy doing. There, there's nothing more rewarding than having a patient come in and say, thank you. And them telling us about, you know, I was back on the golf course for the first time in months and I'm doing it without pain. And, it, you know, my putting still sucks, but I'm, I'm having fun doing it. So it's great to see people um, get back to the things that they love. So uh, 
feel, feel free to come in and see us. And uh, we, we really appreciate your time.